Welcome to the DK Kim Foundation lecture series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the DK Kim Foundation in Ontario, California. Yeah, I've been doing international trade, I guess, all my life. Uh, some of my friends tell me that I was born with a suit on, and my first word was global trade. So I, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, again, I've been involved in international trade for many years, and um, I, I would like to give you this perspective because I think I, I would like for you to uh, learn a little bit about myself and they'll be able to understand as to how uh, what, what is the passion that I have for international trade and where my, com my comments coming from. Again, I have been involved in international trade basically all my professional career. I spent almost uh, 20 years with an international law firm representing companies from the United States, the Pacific Rim, and Europe, and Latin America, and representing many Latin American companies doing business in the United States, primarily in California. Uh, I have served, and I was very honored to serve uh, uh, four governors. Um, I was uh, their advisor in international trade, and also I represented California as the California trade representative in Latin America for a number of years. I was also quite honored to work with, uh, with a number of mayors in international trade, and um, I, I was never a political appointee, uh, always been, uh, uh, I guess, uh, regards to recognition that uh, I am somebody that knows a little bit about international trade. And again, international trade is very important. And I was here uh, probably about three weeks ago talking not only to Dr. Uh, Pike, but also to a number of other faculty members, including you, Dean. And at that time, we were looking and discussing the fact that how important it is for a university to be involved in training individuals for international trade. It's very important. Uh, I think uh, U.S. institutions by far are far behind uh, training a lot of executives, not only if you compare with Europe and, and uh, in Asia. But also we discussed the idea that it's not only learning about the skills that you're going to have in terms of international trade and business, marketing, finance, and other things. But obviously the other uh, issues that are very important also in, in is language and culture. Very important. If you don't understand, or at least you don't blame those three elements of business, culture, language into your international trade, you will not be successful because you will never be able to understand how to do business internationally. So with that in mind, I think what I would like to do is just give you a, a background as to the fact that uh, we are going to talk today about obviously very important, which is the free trade agreement uh, between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. But um, Please don't look at this document just as a document. Uh, I, I think this document is more than that because at the end of the day, what we're going to see is that uh, the success that we have in implementing this document and other free trade agreements with other countries that the United States has will have um, an, an economic impact in our community. And that means that we're going to create more jobs, um, which is good for our families, for our cities, for the states, for the country, and for our universities. Um, so with that, let me, uh, let me start. Um, this is the, the objective that I have at the chamber, creating regional employment through global trade and investment. And we define global trade as exports, imports, and foreign investment. And it is really these three items, exports, imports, and foreign investment, that really uh, are important in everything that we do in international trade. Um, here in this region, the region that I call um, not really Southern California because uh, Southern California involves about 10 counties, but if you type the Los Angeles greater region or the Los Angeles metropolitan region area, it will list the five counties, the county of Ventura, uh, Los Angeles, Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside. This region has 20 million people. And this slide is incorrect because uh, a couple of days ago they told me that uh, the combined gross domestic product of our region 
will make, the 15, it will make us the 15th largest economy in the world. So that is very important. Um, as you know, uh, the state of California is the fifth largest economy in the world. So by being the 15th largest economy in the world ourselves, there is the estimate that our region produces over 50% of the California G GDP, which is very impressive also as well. 431 billion dollars of trade from this region. These are exports and imports that they go in and out through the ports of Los Angeles, port of Long Beach, and LAX. We are, in fact, the main trade hub in the country and one of the most important trade hubs in the Pacific Rim. And as a matter of fact, we have become already the trade hub or the trade link between Latin America and the Pacific Rim. So this is very important. The reason why you need to understand this region is that if you ever work in this region, this is the territory that you need to represent overseas. So this is very important. Now, if you don't know your territory, then obviously you will not be able to understand uh, how it works. Also, the other important thing is that in this region, this region receives, it was last year, 45 million tourists visit this region every year from the United States and abroad. From the marketing perspective, that means that in this region, every year, we have a floating population of 60 million consumers because these tourists are coming to buy, sometimes sell, and do a lot of things with us. So again, from the marketing perspective, from the business strategy, you have to deal with the fact that we're not only four million, four million citizens in, this, in, in, in the city of Los Angeles or 10 million in the county of Los Angeles, but we are 20 in the region plus the tourists. This is very important. Um, the other thing that's very important from the perspective of our global markets is we have the third largest concentration of diplomats in the country after Washington DC and New York. Here in this region, you have 103 countries represented. 103 countries that they have consulates. Out of those 103 countries, about 80 are what we call full-fledged consulates. That means that they have a consul general. The rest are what they call honorary consuls. This is very important and significant, and we think we should be very proud of it, because there are a great number of countries that they see this region as the most important region in the United States, and this is the region why we have so many diplomats. And these diplomats are doing what? Other than visas and passports, they are exporting, importing, and, and they are participating in foreign investment also as well, representing their countries. So this is very important. Again, as I said, we have become the, the global trade and investment in, in, in the United States. As a matter of fact, if you look at the map of um, the Western Hemisphere, you could see that we have probably an unbroken chain of free trade agreements from Canada all the way to Chile with only one exception, that's Ecuador. And in this region of free trade agreements with Canada, the United States, Mexico, Central America, uh, uh, Colombia, we skip Ecuador, and then we go into Peru, Colombia, and Chile. The largest port complex, the largest cargo airport are here. That is how significant it is. Just for your information, the port of Los Angeles and port of Long Beach, they move about over 11 million containers every year of cargo. That is very significant. The second largest port in our hemisphere is Vera, uh, excuse me, is um, uh, the Port of Cardenas in um, Mexico with about less than a million. So you imagine the difference. The other thing that is very important for you to understand is that uh, we talk about $431 million of trade coming in and going to our ports. This number is very significant, and I think this is something you need to also take a note of. 40% of all imports into the United States from all over the world come through our ports. That's how significant is our region. That makes the fact that we are the, the, cap, the logistics capital of the United States because we move so much cargo. 
Um, in 2009 and 10, I was involved in a project with the Brookings Institution as we launched the program, what we call Global Cities. And in 2009, 2010, uh, Los Angeles was selected as the first global city in the United States because, again, the numbers that I just des I described before. In 2009, this is the chart that I got from Brookings in terms of the middle class, of course, you know, purchasing uh, buyers and, and, and folks all over the world. 2009, this is the number today, or at least the one that, that is projected for uh, 2030. This means that 90% of the consumers live outside the United States. If you are in business and you want to sell, well, you've got to go where your uh, customers are. And you need to go not only where your customers are, but also where is the purchasing power. The purchasing power, more than 80%, is outside the United States. No question about it. And so this is the reason as to why you need to keep studying international trade. And you need to go out and graduate and hopefully manage companies that are involved in international trade. International trade doesn't mean that uh, manufacturing companies in the region are going to only export their products and become global, no. Today, that is an old sort of idea. You cannot become global if you are just exporting or importing. Companies have to become global by manufacturing globally. You can no longer be competitive if, not, if you're not manufacturing all over the world. And again, that is how we, we see the world from a very realistic perspective. And the second reason as to why we need to be aggressive in terms of manufacturing overseas is that we cannot afford any longer to have foreign manufacturing companies come into our markets. Because if foreign companies are already selling products here in the United States or in California, that, mean, that means our competition is more uh, difficult and already maybe a bit too late for you to react. So we need to go out and give competition to our competitors in their own markets, in our own terms. Our small and medium-sized companies need a lot of help, and hopefully with your education and your commitment and your experience, you're gonna go and help them, because they need to understand that the markets um, are all over the world and not just Arizona or New Mexico or other states in the United States. Um, also, these companies need to understand that it's very important from the business perspective to learn how to extend the product life cycle of your product. That is very key. We need to teach our small and medium sized manufacturing companies how to extend the product life cycle of the products because our economies are very advanced. Our products, obviously, they are more sophisticated to a certain extent, and therefore we need to learn how to move that to uh, overseas markets so our products will live longer. Very important. And so that means that, as I said before, the executives, I, you know, I don't consider you students. You are uh, what I call uh, executives in training. And so that's very important to become very global. Um, and I'm glad that the university is doing this. Okay, with that background, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about the USTR. The US Trade Representative um, is an agency that was created under President Reagan. Um, before the USTR, every agency in the federal government, from the Secretary of uh, Commerce, Treasury, whatever, they used to, they used to uh, try or attempt to do trade agreements or accords with everybody in the world. And it was a mess because you have everybody all over the place. And so it was Reagan that created the USDR and said, okay, there will be only one federal agency in the United States that it will be fully responsible for negotiating free trade agreements on behalf of the United States. And all other agencies had to come in under the USTR, so to speak, and coordinate all the efforts, but the USTR was going to be the leading agency. And the USTR, who the individual um, that runs this agency, has the ranking of an ambassador and also serves in the cabinet of all the presidents. So this is the reason as to why it's very important to understand the context and the importance of the USTR. Trade agreements uh, can help grow our economy. Uh, we need to have agreements. The United States has agreements with about 20 countries overseas. 
but also there are other, uh, other areas in which there are not free trade agreements, but what they call trade and investment frameworks. And these are perhaps with the smaller economies or economies that gradually will uh, graduate, so to speak, and then become full-fledged trading partners of ours. And then they have other groups, what they call the bilateral investment treaties, um, that are also are, are very important. We're going to talk about how the USDR negotiated uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement about 24 years ago with Canada, Mexico, and the United States, and how that agreement was renegotiated um, this last year. It took almost a year to re renegotiate this agreement. And hopefully tomorrow when I wake up, we'll look at the news from uh, Buenos Aires. Um, as you know, um, G20, um, presidents from 20 nations are meeting in Buenos Aires starting today through, I think, this weekend. And there is a strong possibility in, in that uh, the agreement, the new agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico will be signed tomorrow. Um, and so that is very important. I want to give you um, um, an overall uh, or, or picture of what, what the agreement is all about. It has chapters, uh, has a great number of uh, annexes and side letters like you won't believe. Uh, I don't think there's no one in this country that has read this agreement because it has almost 3,000 pages long. Uh, I read a couple of those, but not 3,000. So, and, and again, um, we're going to let the international uh, experts read that later on, but I'll tell you who's going to be very important in this, in this issue. This is very important because free trade agreements sometimes are locked as the legal framework of a document that it will tell you what to do and what not to do if you're dealing with a given country. And a lot of times, because our companies and uh, executives don't, do not have a lot of experience in global markets, sometimes they grasp this, um, this uh, agree the, the agreement almost as a security blanket because they know that that agreement will provide them the, um, the secure access to different markets in the, the, the aspect of, of having uh, the legalities if they ever have a problems. For us, this agreement is very important from the region because California exports to uh, both Mexico and Canada last year were over $44 billion. California exports to Canada were about $18 billion, and California exports to Mexico, $27 billion. So that means that to these exports and imports that we have, they create a lot of jobs. So um, I would like to um, show you this for a moment. This is the agreement, the table of content. From the business perspective, I think what you need to look at this agreement or any other agreement is a business plan. Because now you have an idea as to how this agreement, this legal framework that is going to be signed by three governments is going to sort of give you the guidelines as to what kind of business you can do. So it is my experience that the best thing you could do with this document is look at it from the perspective it's going to help to develop your business plan. Because then what you need to do is you need to go to the chapter that may be most applicable to you and begin to understand what are the things that you can and cannot do with this agreement. Um, this is very important because, obviously, when you understand the legal framework, then you need to know, you will know the things that you can and cannot do. This is very important. This document um, has been reviewed now for uh, two or three weeks by many chambers of commerce, trade organizations, professional groups, labor unions, and, and a number of things. Uh, and so this is really what is in the deal and the impact it's going to have. Um, it has some changes from the old NAFTA. Uh, many people agree that uh, the agreement has not, is not going far enough. A lot of people believe in the business that uh, the new uh, rules of origin are very important and quite drastic and change quite a lot from uh, previous ones. Labor provisions are very different this time, very important. U.S. farmers are very happy. Canadian farmers are not. Intellectual property is very important, and a lot of people are very happy with this. Um, another change is that uh, investors can no longer sue the government, which is 
very welcomed by everybody else. We'll talk about something that is very important, the Sunset Clause. You probably remember President uh, Trump wanted to negotiate an agreement that um, they were going to review every five years. And if any of the parties did not like the agreement in five years, they could just avoid it. Obviously, this was a quite uh, remarkable. He did not get what he wanted, but he, he got something close to uh, what he wanted. Um, and of course, it will be negotiated um, by others. This section 232 three, two, is very important. And then we're going to talk about a new chapter, that is chapter 32, that is brand new. And a lot of people are having problems with that. And a lot of people, on the other hand, saying that this is a good thing to have. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So let's go, uh, let's go back to the rules of origin. Uh, rules of origin indicate that uh, in order for a product to be considered made in North America, had to have some sort of a percentage of products manufactured or assembled in the in United States and Mexico and Canada. And this is very important because obviously we want to protect our industries and we want to make sure that the products are manufactured in the continent. The rules of origin, and again, this is just again for the presentation because it is more, uh, more complicated than uh, uh, for one hour presentation or maybe less than that, is that I will allow me to just touch upon the rules of origin that they are very impactful to the automobile, automobile industry. In the past, with old NAFTA, if you had a vehicle, a car, or a truck, that it will benefit from the agreement and it will pay less duty rates, there's got to be a, for, a magic formula that it will indicate that vehicle had to be 62.5% made in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Okay? And obviously, companies that are manufacturing those products, they have... Uh, what a challenge because they have to prove that to, uh, to our government. Um, the new agreement has raised the bar to 75%. So today, 75% of a car has to be made in North America. This is very important. That means that uh, uh, there will be more emphasis in manufacturing parts, components in the United States. Therefore, we're going to have more employment. A lot of competitors in, in overseas, especially in the Pacific Rim, don't like this because this means that if you want to have this 75% threshold met, they have to be in the United States and Mexico, United States. Okay. Intellectual property. A lot of people are very happy with this because they have extended the copyright extension or protection from 50 to 70 years. And a lot of people in, in pharmaceutical industries and others, they love this. Uh, so it is, it is our view from the Chamber's perspective that intellectual property chapter in this new agreement is the strongest standard of protection for trade secrets of any agreement that was negotiated by the United States. So we're very happy with that. Digital trade is also protected for the first time ever to the point that no other free trade agreement has the protection in digital trade. Environmental issues also. Great advances is the most comprehensive that any other agreement negotiated by the United States. The agriculture sector was a big winner. And certainly California is a great agricultural sector. Um, a great, um, it was a great uh, access. We're going to have a much greater access to, to Mexico and especially to Canada. Canadians don't like this uh, much, but um, I think they negotiated quite well on, for, on behalf of industry, especially for the dairy industry. Labor and wages also are very unique and different. Um, now, under this agreement, not only especially in manufacturing, especially in the automobile industry, you need to go, and I said before, meet the 75% threshold of uh, rules of origin. But starting in 2023, 40%, 40, between 40 and 40% 40 of automobile has to be produced by workers that they will make at least $16 an hour. This is very significant because obviously this is also a message that we send into Mexico saying you cannot longer count on the fact that uh, you're 
your wages are so low. So if you want to be competitive, that means you have to increase wages in your country. And when you do the um, inventory as to who is producing this product, you need to show us that by 2023, this product is being manufactured by somebody who's making $16 an hour. Quite, uh, quite impressive from our perspective. The Sunset Clause, this is the agreement or that uh, President Trump wanted to, uh, to have in which they will say, in five years from now, if we don't like it, we drop the agreement and we go by. Um, it was a lot of our negotiations, and I think the Canadians did a fantastic job in convincing both the United States and Mexico to be a little bit more uh, amenable, so to speak. And today, the agreement will go for 16 years, but we're going to have a sunset clause that the three countries have agreed to review the agreement every six years. Uh, you know, it's possible that in six years somebody could say, I don't want it anymore. But the likelihood is that uh, the six years primarily are set to make better, change a lot of things, and do not go back to what we did before, where we had a free trade agreement that we signed 24 years, I mean, 24 years later, and we never, we never renew it. We never had a, a, any changes. We never did anything to improve that agreement. So this is very important. Also, this agreement, for the first time, with um, most agreements, they deal quite a lot with the fact of corruption, especially in Mexico. Uh, and certainly corruption not only in terms of business and other things, but also corruption that deals with e-commerce. This is very important. The new chapter that it is raising a lot of eyebrows is chapter 30, 32. This is a new one. This Chapter 32 was never in existence of any agreement. Chapter 32 requires that all three parties, Canada, United States, and Mexico, will notify the other partners about their intention of negotiating or entering into another free trade agreement, what is considered to be a non-market economy. That is, if Mexico and or Canada, they would like to get into a free trade agreement with any other country outside North America, they have to let us know. And they have to let us know with three months notice. And it is the United States or Canada or Mexico that they can say, well, you cannot have this agreement. Or why are you having this agreement? Why don't we sit down and look at what will be the impact of this agreement? So the question now is, Let's again, let's just think a little bit about the global issues and give, I'll give you a hint. We have today uh, a lot of trade disputes. Most people that are involved in international trade believe that this new chapter 32 was designed exclusively to go against China. That's it. And it makes sense because Canada and Mexico, they were looking to see more agreements with China. But this is the reason why. And you're going to probably hear more about this in the press. Um, there's no question in my mind that uh, this uh, will, it, 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 they just, we just want to make sure that uh, North America competes very well with China. That's really what it is. Okay. So please follow uh, in the news if you are a uh, you know, trade news uh, junkie like myself. Um, look at what the people are saying about Chapter 32. This is very important. Okay, so now let's talk about a little bit about what is going to happen. Uh, we, we have an agreement that it was negotiated. There is a possibility that it will probably be signed tomorrow. It doesn't mean that it is ready to be implemented because we need to go through a process. And this process could be very lengthy. Again, before December 1st, it has to be signed. And maybe this tomorrow. And in Buenos Aires, the Prime Minister of Canada, President of Mexico, and President of the United States will probably sign this agreement. Then within 60 days, the, the, the President will notify uh, Congress about uh, this agreement or this new agreement. Uh, and then within 150 days, the International Trade Commission must release a report 
to give us an idea as to what is the impact of this new agreement to our economy. And this is critical. This is the most critical thing that we have. The US International Trade Commission, government agency, but it's almost like a quasi-government agency, they need to give us a report. And their report is final. The report is accepted by everybody you can even imagine. So their report is very important. And as a matter of fact, the ITC has already invited a number of people from government sectors, private sector, labor unions to meet with them as they prepare for this 150 days that they have to do it. Then it will have to be submitted to, uh, to build Congress. And then is considered by both the House and the Senate for a vote. And as you know, under the US uh, law, the agreement cannot be changed in the houses. The vote is up or down. There may be some changes, but it is yes or no. We are very confident that uh, Canada and Mexico are very eager to sign the agreement as it is. The question today is whether or not the US may say yes. And this is because today, as you know, we have a new uh, New Congress, so to speak. We have more Democrats at the House, and this is very important. Um, the Democrats traditionally have been against free trade agreements. Uh, I don't know why. I remember during the negotiations of the free trade agreement in Central America. As you know, the largest congressional delegation in the country is from California. The entire Democratic delegation of Congress voted against the free trade agreement with Central America. That's crazy. But we hope that this time it will be different because there are many, de many Democrats that probably will say yes because, again, this is my view, because this agreement brings pretty good, um, uh, pretty good agreement in terms of labor and environmental provisions. And typically, a lot of uh, Democrats favor anything that has to do with labor and environmental issues. And so we hope that that will be, uh, that will be the case. Um, also, I believe that the, the new guidelines for the automotive sector that we discussed before is going to create more jobs in, in the country. And therefore, the labor unions are going to be very happy with that. If the labor unions are very happy, that means that there'll be more Democrats that are going to be happy also as well. Um, and my hope is in the chamber with many other chambers of commerce in the United States, including the US Chamber of Commerce, which is the largest in the country. We have already contacted members of Congress, members of the Senate, and we believe that the US Congress must approve this, this agreement because it will, it will send a message to the world that the United States is still a leader in international trade, and this will help us with our employment, innovation, and certainly we need to show that uh, um, the United States is very respectful of Mexico and Canada in terms of uh, looking at our differences and making sure that the continent is much stronger. Again, um, please take a look at the uh, US International Trade uh, Commission. This is very important. What are some of the consequences? I mean, in international trade is very difficult. This is almost like uh, trying to play uh, the stock market or being uh, trying to forecast the weather today or tomorrow. But I, I believe that uh, with the years of experience that we have in international trade, that this agreement will bring manufacturing back to the United States. Um, um, there's some reluctancy as to um, whether or not we're gonna have more jobs in the textile and apparel, but I, I think we are going to be because of the rules of origin. So a lot of more companies are gonna be very serious seriously looking at the United States as a manufacturing place. Um, we also are beginning to see that as a result of this uh, trilateral agreement, that the US is beginning to follow a little different path with other countries. As a matter of fact, they have already started negotiating a bilateral agreement with Canada, Korea, and in the UK. And so it is very important to look at what the gentleman said before, that as the United States, Canada, and Mexico become much stronger, 
now the administration is going primarily for bi bilateral trade agreements uh, for, um, uh, for our, our global trade system. Um, the meaning of this could be um, that this obviously will be creating, or at least somebody in the administration is beginning, that this could also improve the supply chains all over the world. Uh, a lot of countries have a lot of bilateral agreements, and a lot of times we criticize the United States by going bilateral and not multilateral. China has 16 already. Uh, this is very important. Um, the tougher rules in sourcing cars and textiles and apparels uh, will make that a lot of Asian manufacturers will have very tough times in finding markets in North America if they don't manufacture here. So we, we do see that there will be more joint ventures of especially companies that uh, they are in the textile and apparel from the Pacific Rim coming back to the United States, especially to uh, California where the, you know, we have obviously a lot of the design is made here. Um, and then finally, the other thing that I would like for you to just think about it is, you know, we talk about the free trade agreements, uh, we talk about a number of things, um, but with everything that I discuss, uh, I hope the question comes to your mind and says, but whatever you discuss and whatever we have with free trade agreements, is this really a free trade agreement or is this managed trade? Okay, and that is really the, 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 the idea that we need to look at it. Uh, how could it be a free trade agreement when you have uh, 3,000 pages regulating everything that you need to do? Is it then more managed trade? Or is it just a, an international document that's giving me an idea as to the things that I can and cannot do? Um, Again, in closing, I want to thank you for the invitation. I, I hope we can spend more time in, with Q&A. So I'd be delighted to answer any, any questions. I hope I have given you a um, few things to, to think about this agreement with the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Um, but I think the most important idea is as you go into, as long, when you graduate, and then you look for a job, you need to get involved in international trade. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of executives in the United States, especially here in California, are not terribly involved in international trade. And, and it's not because they don't want to. It's because we are blessed. We are blessed with, because we have a very strong economy. We don't really need to learn about how to do business in other countries. All we need to do is pick up the phone and find a, a, a customer in Texas Arizona or somewhere, and we don't have to deal with uh, letters of credits. We don't have to deal with culture or uh, languages. So it is much easier to stay in the United States. So this is the, the importance that I place in a program like yours. You need to learn more and do more trade. Uh, in other countries, um, you know, if you look at uh, Korea, if you look at uh, Singapore, Indonesia, and other countries, they have to learn international trade basically from the time they are born because their markets are smaller, their economies are much smaller, and not as big as ours. Uh, extending a product life cycle in any product, in any, in any industry in that product is very welcome. You know, uh, consumer products, uh, anything, you know. Uh, you gotta realize that a lot of technologies that we have here are so advanced, other countries don't have that yet. And so if, if your product life cycle is, let's say, 12 years, you may go somewhere else and extend it for maybe two, three, four more years. That is the, the, the limit. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is, there are a lot of limitations, a lot of restrictions, a lot of things that we need to do according to the book. Um, this is the reason why it's so important when you look at uh, the agreement that you look at it and look what are the, the things that you can cannot do because in some areas may not allow you to do a lot of things and others may allow you, yeah. It's, 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 it's managed trade, it's not free trade. The, um, the Canadians and um, the US and Canada have always said that, uh, especially when dealing with Mexico in the auto industry, we're always in a disadvantage. And we'll always be in a disadvantage if Mexico does not raise their, uh, their uh, salaries. Um, 
The average per hour automotive worker in the United States earns probably about $30 or more. In Mexico today, in some cases, it's less than five. So if we look at from that economic perspective, companies are always going to go to hire somebody that makes less than $10 an hour. By the way, somebody making $10 an hour in Mexico is doing a pretty good job, and the quality of their work is pretty, pretty good. And so right now, uh, the labor unions basically have said, look, we also need to raise the standard of living in Mexico. And so by 2023, Mexico now responsible for developing a program where in the automotive sector, the employees, they will be making $16 an hour, and they have to prove that these individuals are directly involved in manufacturing between 40 and 45%, I think it is, of that car or that truck. It's going to take some time. It's going to be a, a long process. But at least the recognition is that in some cases, uh, this was needed because otherwise Mexico, for political reasons, will always try to keep their uh, wages down. That is the reason as to why they did the $16. Probably the most uh, uh, profit, not profit, but the most uh, important program that we have for students is our internships. We do have a lot of internships. I usually get about, uh, in, a, in, a, in a given semester, in our global unit, uh, we will get about two or three. And the majority are from universities near uh, the chamber, which is downtown LA. Um, these students, uh, <clears throat> obviously are involved in international trade. <clears throat> they want to learn more. And what we tend to do at the chamber is, and I am committed to this, is I'm not going to have an intern becoming a clerk that is going to be shuffling papers or anything like that. They get, they get involved in a lot of things. As a matter of fact, the interns that I have or have had all these years they participate in almost in every meeting that I have. So if I have a delegation from uh, Vietnam, a delegation from Spain, from whatever country, investors, business executives that they want to do business in, in, in the region, business executives that they want to learn about how to do business with the five counties, uh, they are in the meeting with me. Um, every time that we have speakers, and we have pretty good speakers, um, we had um, this last couple of months, just to give you an idea, we had a representative from the World Economic Forum. We had a representative from the World Bank. We had a representative from the Export and Import Bank of the United States. Um, we had a representative from uh, Colombia, Canada. And the feedback that I received from them is what they get at the chamber especially in these meetings, and uh, allow me to refer to the meeting with the World Economic Forum. That information, they cannot get in class, in a class situation. Okay? So the internships are, are pretty, uh, pretty substantial for us. Uh, and I'll, I must tell you that, uh, you know, I have been in, uh, after, after 20 years in a law firm, I moved to the chamber about 10, in this last eight years, I've seen a lot of students that have gone through our internship programs that have ended up either getting an MBA somewhere in international trade. Some are working in Washington for international trade organizations. We have one that is working for the uh, uh, World Trade Organization in Geneva. And so again, uh, it's not only the internship, but it's also the, the networking and the context that you have. Thank you.